so uh, I have uh, a great respect for the third cranial nerve uh, because uh, th this is a nerve that's notorious and it never follows any rule, uh, even though we have lots of rules that govern a third nerve palsies. Um, so why do I call this a troubling third? Well, first, it's a very notorious nerve because it's associated with life-threatening pathologies. Um, and um, whenever I see somebody with a third cranial nerve, I always find it a difficult diagnosis, even when it seems like a slam dunk, because it doesn't always follow the rules that we get uh, about the third nerve. Uh, the one thing I want to just talk about a little bit is the anatomy of the third nerve, because that really affects why it's so difficult and notorious. Uh, the third nerve lives up in the midbrain area, and uh, it, it goes through the midbrain, and we're going to talk about the uh, intrafascicular, the fascicular portion of the third nerve. It passes between the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. It then enters the cavernous sinus, where it then divides into the superior and inferior divisions of three. And, uh, and then, of course, it goes to supply the, the eyelid, the superior rectus, the medial rectus, the inferior rectus, uh, and, uh, and, of course, also the pupil. Um, and in this cartoon, you can see the most important structures that the fascicle of the third nerve passes by. And that's the red nucleus within the midbrain and also the cerebral peduncle. And we're going to see when we look at different types of third nerve palsies, we're gonna look at what, what you can see with third nerve palsies besides passing between posterior cere uh, cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. It also gets into this cavernous sinus area where it comes in close contact with the fifth cranial nerve and then divides up into the superior and inferior branch. Um, this is a uh, dissection of, a, of, a, of the third, third nerve. It's a big nerve. It's probably one of the largest cranial nerves um, coming out of the brainstem, maybe behind the fifth cranial nerve and the eighth cranial nerve. Uh, and as you can see, it very closely goes by the internal carotid artery and the, this cavernous sinus area. These are high real estate areas where other nerves uh, coalesce. Here, uh, in a close-up view, you can see how closely applied arteries are to the third nerve. And, and uh, both here, right after the peduncle, when it goes underneath the posterior cerebral artery, but as it goes to the uh, posterior communicating and the internal carotid artery as well, uh, a, a frequent site of aneurysms. And in this breakaway drawing of the cavernous sinus, you can see how this third nerve then uh, traverses alongside the internal carotid artery, sitting very close by the fourth nerve, uh, uh, also by V1, uh, the first division of five, uh, before it en enters into the superior orbital fissure. Now the blood supply to the third nerve is also really important. Uh, so third nerve is supplied by numerous uh, arterial supplies, and that means that it has a watershed zone. Um, so uh, anteriorly, uh, you can see that the ophthalmic artery, uh, let me use the arrow here. So you can see that the ophthalmic artery uh, uh, supplies sort of that portion that is going towards the orbit, uh, but then the infralateral trunk uh, comes off and it supplies numerous things, but it has a huge supply to the third nerve. Uh, and then the posterior cerebral artery also supplies the third nerve. That means that there are these water zone or watershed zones where where water uh, arterial supply comes in and it makes this nerve more susceptible to ischemia. And, uh, and, and this is supposedly how you get an ischemic third nerve palsy is uh, the, because of this, these three uh, arteries, at least, supplying the third nerve. Now, the other thing that's extremely important to realize is that the pupillary fibers aren't widely dispersed in the nerve. They start out superiorly as they leave the midbrain. And this becomes important, right, because 
uh, I was, uh, had a patient where we were really wondering about whether uh, there could be compression on the third nerve causing a dilated pupil. And, uh, but you have to know where the pupillary fibers are. And so when it leaves the midbrain, they lie superiorly. And as it goes medially, as it goes further out into um, the cistern, you're going to see it move medially. So it goes from superior, superior, medially, to medial, and then it goes into the orbit on the inferior division of three. That means that when it's sitting in that uh, inter, uh, internal carotid, posterior communicating region, those fibers are medial, and guess what's right there? It's the connection between the internal carotid and the posterior communicating, and when those aneurysms hit it, they're going to cause that pupil to dilate. So this, these pupil, the, where the pupil fibers are, greatly affects whether you are going to see pupil involvement or not. Now I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to show you uh, cases, and all the rest of this lecture is basically cases to help us understand uh, the third nerve. And and I'm going to start with nuclear third. This is a very rare condition. I probably have maybe seen two nuclear thirds in my whole career, and they're never completely complete, but you do need to know about it because the, uh, these nuclear thirds take out the levator complex, which uh, is the central caudal nucleus, and that means that both eyelids are down and so are both superior recti. So it's very specific, or, and you may get a little flavor of a partial kind of third on one side, but you see bilateral ptosis and bilateral superior rectus uh, involvement, at least partially. And stroke is the usual cause of this, although uh, you can also see it with tumors. And now um, let's look at a case of a uh, nuclear third. So this is a guy. Has a nuclear third now, can we get the volume up? Does anybody know how to get the volume up here? Bilateral ptosis made him tilt his head backwards. And it's all right. You can just see that the, he had bilateral ptosis. Now, here's what's bizarre, of course. He's got medial rectus involvement on the left side, and that's part of the third. So you see these variations of partial third nerve palsies. Um, and you can see his down gaze is not bad. Okay, but his up gaze is going to be uh, affected in part, and then these, this bilateral ptosis, and then a variation of a third nerve, like a medial rectus uh, deficit. But that the characteristic finding is this bilateral ptosis, variable up gaze problems, and then you'll see a partial third uh, uh, when you see them. So you could see where somebody might think, oh, is this an INO? Is this something else? But you really have to look at that bilateral ptosis to tell you that that's what's going on. So this is a nuclear third nerve palsy. Uh, and uh, this wonderful video was done by Dr. Shirley Ray. Now, because the third nerve in the midbrain goes right by the red nucleus and the uh, cerebral peduncles, you can imagine that you can get different syndromes that are affected by this vesicular third. And, uh, and this frequently is either going to be weakness, it's going to be tremor, or an ataxia, on, usually on the opposite side. So you'd see the third nerve on one side, and then you'll see weakness on the other side, tremor on the other side, and, uh, and you might see a little bit uh, uh, of uh, ataxia also on the other side. I have seen this diagnosis in triage clinic at least three times, twice within the last five years. So this is not completely rare. So let's look at uh, one of these syndromes. So this is a third nerve palsy, uh, uh, and, it, and then you're going to tell me whether it's Weber. So here, which side is her third nerve palsy on? It's going to be on the right. Now let's demonstrate the features of the third nerve palsy. Besides the ptosis, she's able, she can't adduct that eye. 
down gaze slightly impaired. She right doesn't hand. introduct that much e either. Not and of course, she's got elevation deficit. She's got good lateral rectus function, so her sixth nerve is intact. And now she's going to demonstrate the neuro exam. You can do this in the chair. This is a, this part you can do because all you got to have them doing is sitting, put their arms outstretched. If they're weak, they're going to not be able to lift that arm up, right? Patient's been asked to touch she's got a good facial uh, strength. Where she can see now, the left eye. so what is going on here? So she's doing finger nose testing. So she's not weak. It's not a tremor. Striking a of the left arm. She's, what would you say is going on with that left arm? Combination here is ataxia, right. Okay, so if she's ataxic, which of those three syndromes is it? Up to Claude syndrome. She just gave you the answer. Let's go back to this one here. So Weber is when you're weak on the opposite side. Benedict's is when you've got a tremor. Uh, uh, tremor with ataxia, and sometimes you can have chorioathetosis, but Claude syndrome is an ata ataxia. So she had Claude syndrome from a stroke that affected uh, uh, the, the midbrain. All right, so those are kind of the central third nerve syndromes that you need to know about. Now let's talk about what are the rules that we learn about the third nerve. So the first rule that we learn is when there's a complete ocular motor nerve palsy with completely intact pupillary function, it's usually ischemic and no imaging is required unless it doesn't get better in 48 weeks. Isn't that kind of the rule? Even in medical school, you learn that that's sort of the rule. We can talk about imaging uh, controversies as well. Uh, when there's ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, and a poorly reactive pupil, so the combination of the ocular motor nerve palsy, ptosis, uh, and, and the pupil is, is poorly reactive, that sends off bells, whistles, red lights, there's serious pathology, and you've got to do CT, MR, conventional angiogram, because you've got a pupil involving third nerve palsy. And the third rule is if there's a complete, if there's a non-reactive, poorly reactive pupil without any ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, or other localizing findings, you don't suspect a beginning of a third nerve palsy. Usually you're thinking tonic pupil, pharmacologic blockade, or some other cause of the pupil. So now I'm going to take you through why these rules don't always work for a people and why this third nerve can be such a, a difficult one. So this is a diabetic woman, and she came in with this third nerve palsy. Now, the first thing you notice, there's a couple things on this, and the first of all, I'm just going to tell you because it's hard to see, that that left pupil is just slightly larger than the right pupil, just very slightly larger. It still works. And then there's one other finding on here that tells you that this is not a complete third. What's the other finding on here? What is it? That her pupil's not completely, or that her lid is not completely down, right? So her lid's not complete. So there's two things here. It, it's got, she has incomplete ptosis and she has a slightly large pupil. So uh, it is true that about one out of five ischemic thirds will have a small amount of pupillary involvement. But in a study that's been done and replicated, uh, my, my colleague Dan Jacobson, when I was a fellow, actually did this study where he took relative pupil sparing third nerve palsies, and yes, well, out of the 24 patients, 10 of them were third nerve infarctions. Uh, these relative pupil sparing uh, third nerve palsies uh, also ended up being paracellar masses, either primary or secondary, eight of them, eight out of the 24, a third of them, uh, aneurysm and two, uh, a um, carcinomatous infiltration, leptomeningeal involvement in one, telosa hunt syndrome, uh, and so on. So while the rule is that if the pupil's spared, mostly, uh, it should be ischemic, it doesn't always follow the rule on that. So 
you can't the the answer to the question is when you see a pu when there is partial pupil involvement or an incomplete third you cannot apply that ischemic rule now yesterday we saw a patient with a flat out third nerve palsy painful third nerve palsy no pupillary involvement but it was a complete third nerve palsy he, he couldn't look in up or down and he had a complete, completely uh, a spared pupil and so we we were able to apply that rule but but if it's if it's partial you really need to be aware all right now here's another case this is a woman who we're lifting her lid because her lid is completely down and while it's a little difficult to appreciate, she does have a large pupil that is very poorly reactive. She doesn't look up, she doesn't look down, she cannot adduct, and you can see over here, her adduction is definitely deficient. She's got fine abduction. Um, and uh, so we call this a pupil involving third nerve palsy. And do we just say, listen, uh, why don't you go home? We'll see you in four to eight weeks. And uh, Trevor says, no, we can't do that. Uh, so we did image her, and she did have a PCIC aneurysm compressing the third nerve. And because those pupillary fibers were right there mesially, right? Remember when we talked about how the pupil fibers come on the top and move mesially, medially on the nerve? Uh, it compressed the pupil fibers, and that was a third nerve palsy. And these aneurysms are notorious for compressing the nerve. They usually never just cause an isolated, uh, dilated pupil. You always see something more with it. You can find an exo, you can find a little ptosis, et cetera, et cetera. So it's usually a partial third. So here's a pupil involving third nerve palsy. It's a, uh, the guy's lid is down, so it is complete. Uh, often they're a little exo if you raise their lid, and you can see how that pupil is large. There's sometimes a little bit of movement, of, uh, you know, a small amount of movement, but you can see that he cannot uh, depress the pupil. And he can't elevate the pupil. Uh, Depress the eye, he can't elevate the eye. Six nerve function. And superduction is obviously impaired. And I think if you watch, you can also see that there is pupil involvement. The anisocoria is greater in light than dark. And so this person actually had a, uh, and this is just demonstrating the large exo deviation that he has as well. Uh, but that person actually had a dolichoactatic vessel that was uh, compressing his third nerve and uh, giving them a pupil involving. Um, so uh, I wanted to just stress again where the pupil fibers are, um, superiorly, going mesially, and entering in inferiorly. Uh, and always look for a small amount of exophoria or slight ptosis if you see a big pupil. Uh, the pupil may lack true denervation supersensitivity in the pilocarpine testing and beware if there's pain. Uh, this was a, a patient sent to me for an 80s pupil. Um, and uh, this was a while back. But you can see that she's got bilaterally big pupils, right? And when we shined light in her eye, the left pupil came down somewhat. The right did not uh, constrict whatsoever. What is there any, this person was 28 years old. She had a new onset of headache over the right eye, continuous pain. She noticed this dilated pupil, and so the question is, is this an 80s pupil? This was after pilocarpine testing, and the pupil did not come down. Is this an 80s pupil? Is there any clue that tells you something else could be going on here? It's also tonic. But, pardon? Uh, I was saying pretty much everything points to something more dangerous. So she may have a little ptosis, okay. What else do you see? She's got exo, right? She's, she's a little bit exophoric there. And um, she really had very little except for the pupil, the ptosis, and an exo. That was it. But it was the pupil, the ptosis, and the exo that told me something had to be going on. So we got her 
uh, CT scan. And uh, we got the CT scan and, um, and it was read as normal. So is this a normal CAT scan? This is a CT with contrast. Is this a normal CT? Dr. Jacobson, is this a normal CT? Dr. Wong, anybody? Do you think this is a normal CT? Dr. Bear? Okay, why, Chris, why do you say no? Um, well, because um, you're showing it to us. What? <laughs> you're showing it to us, I'm assuming it's not normal. But um, I'm looking on the right side, because that's where we expect the pathology to be, right? Um, it's on that right side. All right, so on the right side, you're seeing a little bit of extra enhancement, like right in here and maybe a little widening of the cavernous sinus here. And that's what I saw too. So I sent her for an MR and she actually had a metastatic uh, uh, tumor uh, in the uh, an, a very malignant pituitary cancer and she was dead in six months. So this, I just want you to be aware that uh, when you see this pupillary dilation that has a partial third, there's gonna be something going on here that you have to uh, look at, okay? All right, now this is a lady who came in uh, with a bout of a partial third nerve palsy, uh, pupil sparing, and, uh, and she got ptosis, and she had diplopia, and she was exo, uh, and this happened three times. So this is what we call a repetitive third nerve palsy. And each time she would get enhancement of her third nerve right through the cavernous sinus. And uh, so you can see these idiopathic, repetitive ocular motor nerve palsies in normal people. Usually it's thought to be viral infection. In one of these episodes, we did do a spinal tap and found um, uh, white cells in the spinal fluid. But uh, it, it is one of those things that you do need to be aware of that you can get repetitive third nerve palsies. Do those patients deserve repeat imaging? Pardon? Do those patients deserve repeat imaging, or do they get like one time or something? You know, over I, re I it repeated her imaging uh, almost every time because I was worried that she had something else in addition to this idiopathically recurrent third nerve palsy. It's good to know that you can have recurrent third nerve palsies like this that can be viral related, but I think you, you always have to be circumspect. In my experience, this is why the third nerve is so hard, because it doesn't follow these rules, and then it can do weird things, like become a repetitive third, like what, you know, you have to be very careful with these third nerve palsies. All right, now, I wanna talk about third nerve palsies in children. Um, these can be associated with aneurysm, schwannomas, infections, migraine, and uh, they can be from tra trauma. Uh, this was a boy, that I saw who had a right third nerve palsy, and he also had headaches. Um, and uh, they saw an abnormality on his MR scan, and he, they wanted to go ahead and remove this abnormality on the MR. But you should be aware of this. So this is this little enhancing lesion at the nerve root exit zone of the third nerve, right here and here. and. Uh, and they were gonna go in and remove it. Well, if they'd removed it, number one, he would have had a complete third nerve palsy for the rest of his life. And number two, this is, this is very typical of these recurrent painful ophthalmoplegic neuropathies, or it used to be called ophthalmoplegic migraine, but they're usually a unilateral headache with ipsilateral paresis of one, two, or all three of the ocular motor nerves. So it could be third, which is the most common, fourth, sixth, and it's usually painful. And then you usually can see this little enhancing lesion and it goes away. That little enhancing lesion will go away, but it's right at the nerve root exit zone. So I, call, I talked to the neurosurgeon and said, don't remove that, this is gonna go away. Let's re-image him down the line, but let's not go and give him a permanent uh, third nerve palsy. But you do need to know about 
uh, sort of these repetitive third nerve palsies, this recurrent painful ophthalmoplegic neuropathy, uh, yeah, recurrent neuropathy. All right, now uh, I'm gonna switch gears to a different uh, problem, and this is a 34-year-old man. He has had a two-year history of horizontal double vision. He then had a spell in 1994, um, and he had a normal MRI scan, and on exam, he, his acuity was 2020. He had no afferent defect. He had slightly so, slowed adducting saccades. He had a minor limitation of adduction and depression in the left eye. Uh, he had a 35 diopter uh, exophoria, and it was actually tropic uh, uh, intermittently. And then uh, his visual fields were normal. So now let's look at this picture and try to determine what's going on with this guy. So when he looks at you, Let's just look at him. When he looks at you, uh, what do you uh, on primary gaze, what do you see? So that's on the left. Say it loudly. So we can ptosis. Okay. Anything else? Exo. exo A little exo. Okay. When he looks to the right. Left eye deduction deficit. A deduction deficit and. He's got a little bit of, what, what do you notice when he looks to the right? Lid retraction. Lid retraction. Okay, what, what does that signify, lid retraction? Aberrant. Aberrant regeneration. Exactly, okay, so aberrant regeneration. Now, so you, if, now this guy did not ever have a third nerve palsy. He came in with this intermittent kind of double vision, then it became more complete double vision. When you see aberrant regeneration, uh, especially of the third nerve, there's pathology, okay? And he did have a, a, a pituitary mass tumor. So these cellar masses, so when I was talking about how it goes right by the cavernous sinus, these cellar masses really just in, uh, invade and, and compress the third nerve, and it's notori a notorious area for getting uh, tumors to cause aberrant regeneration. So what are the subtle signs of aberrant regeneration that you can look for on exam with a third nerve palsy? So one, and the easiest one is this eyelid synkinesis, okay? So that you've got a little ptosis, and then when you, uh, you, you put the eye in that position, so when he was looking to the, to the right with his left eye, his eyelid just pops up. So that's a pretty easy one to see. Uh, pseudo uh, graphy sign is kind of a retraction elevation of the lid on down gaze so they look down and their lid pops up okay and it looks like they've got lid retraction retraction of the globe you can actually see almost the globe retracting um, and then adduction of the eye if you're looking up or down you can see adduction of the eye with vertical movements uh, sometimes you can see the pupil constrict in adduction so the uh, aberrant regeneration is with the pupil uh, and the third nerve, and then you can see an OKN uh, change. Uh, the rule here is you see aberrant regeneration, it's a intracavernous tumor or meningioma until proven otherwise. It's absolutely going to have pathology if it's got uh, aberrant regeneration, primary aberrant regeneration. So here is somebody who's got aberrant regeneration of the third nerve. Bo uh, uh, bilaterally. So when he looks to the left, his uh, one lid opens up, opens up. When he looks to the right, his other lid opens up. So he's got synkinesis with eye movements. Okay. Now um, I'm going to talk about intermittent thirds. Uh, so now intermittent thirds are rare. Uh, and they're usually transient spasms of the muscles that are innervated by the third, the sixth, or the fourth. And the key here is there's usually a previous history of radiation, uh, so like pituitary radiation or something like that. Um, and, and what they, happens is that they can look normal, and then all of a sudden they have this uh, muscle, it's like a muscle cramp. And you do have to image unless there's been previous radiation. And now I'll see if I can get this to work. Uh, this is the video that sometimes has the hardest trouble. 
del suelo. So this is a guy with intermittent third nerve palsies, and uh, so we're just looking at him. We're going to ask him to move his eyes around. He doesn't really have any major ptosis. He did have a little bit of exo there, maybe a little hyper. Far left gaze. So what we did was we put him into uh, one of the gazes and held it there for a while and then see how the medial rectus just fires and it's like a cramp of the medial rectus muscle. And uh, this is called neuromyotonia, ocular neuromyotonia. And then it goes back to normal. So it's something to think about when you see somebody with intermittent diplopia to at least ask about uh, you know, whether their eyes kind of get stuck in a certain position. And he can get it to go away slowly by relaxing his eyes. Sometimes blinking can make it go away. How do you differentiate it with, uh, with convergence path? So uh, sometimes you can treat this with um, gabapentin, carbamazepine, um, so there are ways to treat it. And, um, and then reassurance, I mean, he has had a history of previous uh, radiation. This is not a common thing to happen, but at, le at least you need to know about it. Okay, so pupil involving third nerve palsies, you have to look for other cranial nerves because it sits very close to the fifth nerve. Uh, imaging is absolutely essential. MR scan has to be done, uh, and often an MRA. Sometimes you have to do angiograms if the MRA or CTA is negative. And always think about another diagnosis. I had a guy with a pupil involving third, uh, did the imaging, did angiogram, everything was negative, and then he got another cranial nerve palsy, and we did a lumbar puncture, and he had actually had lymphoma. So it's really important. Important. If you've got a pupil involving third, you shouldn't be sleeping at night. Okay, that you should be uh, uh, thinking about it. Pupil sparing third nerve palsies. Remember, it's relative sparing. Most of the time, you're going to see a little anisocoria. These are usually painful, and they should be complete. If you're going to call it an ischemic third, it better have hypertension, diabetes as risk factors. It better have pain. It better not have aberrant regeneration. It better not have anything else going on with it. It better just be a complete third nerve palsy with pupil, basically pupil sparing. All right, now I'm going to go into a section that I call third nerve plus. So this is an African-American man. He was actually at the VA hospital. He had fever, pain. He had increasing diplopia. He had a third nerve palsy, proptosis, and numbness of his right cheek. Okay. Now, when you get numbness, the, the other lesson here is when you see a third nerve palsy, you've got to look for the fifth nerve. Okay, that's like, that's like part of the deal. You've got to make sure that the fifth nerve is intact. Why do, I, why do I mention this? Because if cavernous sinus lesions are going to give you uh, trouble with the fifth nerve, absolutely. So he has numbness on the right cheek. So what division of five is that? Two. Two. And do, what, I mean, are you going to just say, well, you know, you've got, a, you've got a pupil involving third. Well, you know, we'll see around. We're going to image him, right? So we, we imaged him, and we saw that he's got a widened cavernous sinus bilaterally, uh, really wide. Here's his carotid arteries. Um, and... Uh, he had cavernous sinus thrombosis. So fever, <laughs> headache, paresthesias, often that chemosis, uh, often it'll be V1 involved, but it can be V2. And of course, orbital vein thrombosis could look a little bit like this, but uh, what is going to be different about orbital vein thrombosis versus cavernous sinus thrombosis? 
trigeminal involvement, absolutely. That's, that's the key piece that you have to go after. And you have to think about things like uh, telosa hunt, which we'll talk about in a little bit, mucor, orbital apex syndrome, and, um, and of course, uh, checking white count, um, treating them with antibiotics, et cetera. So the cavernous sinus syndromes is really a third nerve, sometimes fourth. How do you tell a fourth nerve is intact? And, and Trevor got to do this yesterday. How do you tell that the fourth nerve is intact when you have a third nerve palsy? Do you remember how we did that yesterday? There were so many patients yesterday, you probably forgot. You can't remember. Okay, anybody else? You have them look down and you look for intorsion. Uh, intorsion, and that'll tell you that the fourth nerve is intact uh, with a third, okay? Uh, and so, uh, but you have to be thinking pituitary tumors, meningiomas, infections, but having that numbness or uh, any problem with that fifth nerve or a Horner syndrome really brings it out of the brings it out of an isolated third nerve into this what I call third nerve plus, which means you have to image them because there's always something going on. All right, what do you think happened here? What? Shingles. Shingles. Okay. So yeah, this is a woman who had. Horrible, horrible, horrible pain over her left eye. Then she developed a little ptosis. Then she developed a third nerve palsy. And it wasn't until the rash came out that we stumbled to the fact that she had a third nerve palsy, but that's uh, yeah. that she had shingles and uh, herpes zoster. Pardon? I think a video is playing in the background. I, I think you have a yeah. video playing in the background behind. Yeah, it's coming from the computer. Huh. I don't know where it is, but do you think you know where it is? It's probably the video you have the model. This one? Yes. Oh, so let's get rid of that. Okay. All right. So um, she actually ended up having enhancement around the cavernous sinus uh, and even the third nerve enhanced. And uh, you could see the enhancement of the third nerve as well on the coronals. And she actually had a small stroke after this. So uh, uh, zoster is not a benign uh, condition. This is a woman who went over to Wendover and got into domestic quarrel and in the parking lot and uh, so she's got her lid down, she has proptosis, um, and she developed uh, sort of pulsatile, uh, a pulsatility around the third nerve. She had complete ophthalmoplegia, and so what do you think happened to her? And I've got an MR scan that uh, has the answer here. Chris, you, you're shaking your head, you know. Fistula. It's a CC fistula. Great. And so here on this T2, you can see this is really interesting because, you know, the cavernous sinus has these venous channels that can connect both sides, and you never see those open unless you've got blood flowing through uh, the cavernous sinus. So she had this huge fistula that uh, needed to be uh, closed and um, all right, now this is a 59-year-old woman. She had a long history of migraine, but she developed a new headache over the right frontal region. Her acuity was normal. She had ptosis, and then she had limited, uh, limited depression and abduction. She had a right hyper, she had an ESO, and she had reduced sensation over V1, V2. So where do you uh, localize the lesion? Anybody? Localized lesion. So we've got ptosis, limited depression, and also an abduction deficit, as well as decreased sensation over V1, V2. Cavernous sinus, okay. And here she is. So she's got a little bit of ptosis, a little limitation of depression, uh, also slightly uh, poor uh, uh, adduction. 
And uh, what she had was enhancement of the cavernous sinus that went all the way back on the dura. Uh, it was, uh, the cavernous sinus on this side was very much enhancing. And, uh, uh, and this is, we did a spinal tap and she had um, elevated protein um, and then she had resolution with steroids. So this is Telosa Hunt. Uh, it's a painful uh, ophthalmoplegia. It uh, can occur at any age. The third nerve is notoriously involved uh, almost always. Uh, sixth, fourth, fifth, and sympathetics variably. Um, you can't see proptosis. Rarely you can see optic nerve involvement. You've got to do an MR with gatto, gadolinium. And uh, steroids are the treatment for Telosa Hunt, and, but it can be due to tumors, infection, uh, and uh, other disorders. So it's, it also is one of those really difficult diagnoses that you really have to pull out all the stops to work it up. So this, this guy came in with a painful uh, ophthalmoplegia on the right side. He had diplopia, and then he had a decreased corneal reflex. And you can see he has a, almost a complete third nerve palsy where his lid is totally down. He can't adduct at all, can't look down. Um, and, uh, and he had numbness, he had loss of the corneal reflex, which took it out of a, just a third nerve palsy. Um, and you can see on his scan, he has a, a widened cavernous sinus on that right side. And what this ended up being was small cell cancer with a lung primary tumor. Uh, these Telosa hunts are notorious for harboring uh, nasty things. And you, uh, you see this, you really have to work it up completely. So uh, the problem of Telosa Hunt, it absolutely requires imaging. You often have to do a CSF examination. Uh, and uh, you have to really, even if imaging is negative, you've got to think of other things. Uh, diabetes can mimic this because of the pain. Giant cell arteritis, syphilis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, systemic lupus. And prednisone, for a true Telosa Hunt, which is an idiopathic inflammatory condition of the posterior orbit or cavernous sinus uh, is prednisone, but the problem is that telosa hunt is extremely difficult and you always have to work it up. So just a couple other conditions uh, that I wanna bring up before the quiz. So this is BJ, uh, she's 12 years old, a rubber ball hit her uh, eye um, two months before, and she had the slow onset of ptosis of the right eyelid then double vision, she had an MR scan, which was normal. She had a normal afferent uh, exam, acuity was great, pupils were normal. But she do, did have a two diopter hyper, an exo uh, in left gaze. And her mom said, I think that the kid who threw the ball caused this in my daughter. And this is how she looks. So let's look at the photo and see if we can kind of diagnose what's going on. So. Um, Catherine, what do you see here? So she has some um, right ptosis. Right ptosis. She has adduction deficit in the left as well. As she doesn't adduct. Um, and then a little bit of superduction deficit as well. Okay, so it looks like a partial third, right? Okay, so imaging's negative. Is there any other test that you would want to do on this kit? Can you think of anything else you could do? You already did vessel imaging? Huh? You already did vessel imaging also? Vessel imaging has been done, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, this kid got everything done. Are you kidding the mom? <laughs> your mom, you know, your kid has a third nerve palsy. What are you going to do, man? You're going to, you're going to go, you know, she's like. You do an LP. You could do an LP. Is there anything else you could do? Forced deductions. What? Forced deductions. Forced deductions. Good idea. Why would you think about forced deductions? Because it was a traumatic wound. Because it was traumatic. Maybe there's some impingement on the muscle or something like that. Okay. Well, I didn't. I there were a couple other clues to me. One clue was in the morning she would look pretty normal. And by the end of the day, she looked like this. So now, what clue does that give you? Right. So we did a rest test, and uh, she was totally normal. 
So not all third nerves are what they seem. And I'm going to tell you the three things that I look for. One is myasthenia. Now, myasthenia is never going to give you pupillary involvement, right? Never. Put that in your brain. Never. You're not going to see pupils involved with myasthenia. So if pupils involved, it is not myasthenia, OK? So uh, myasthenia. Myositis, so inflammatory conditions or muscle conditions, Graves' disease. And the third one that I sometimes put in here, but I didn't for this lecture, is multiple sclerosis. Um, you can see a, a partial third nerve palsy as the presenting sign of multiple sclerosis. Usually there's a lesion in the midbrain, but not always. So be thinking about these mimickers. So here are my recommendations for troubling thirds. Uh, one. You may want to know the rules, but you better know the exceptions to the rules, okay? Know the exceptions to all the rules that we talked about. Use caution in applying these rules to young people less than 20. And kids, they never follow the rules at all. Um, and uh, if there's an extra ocular muscle palsy is incomplete, when that third nerve palsy is incomplete, you've got to be careful because that is not a complete third. And all of a sudden, it, it, it's brought into the more complicated category. If the pupil's partially involved, you've got you've to work them up. Uh, do not apply these rules unless it's an isolated third nerve palsy. And, and, and by that, I mean you've got to check that trigeminal sensation, look at the corneal reflex, think about other entities uh, as well. If the pa patient has cancer, these rules do not apply. Every single patient gets a complete workup. Uh, even if the imaging is negative, angio is negative, and the pupil's involved, keep looking. Think about doing a lumbar puncture, think about repeating the imaging. Uh, maybe the imaging wasn't adequate. Okay, uh, and that, with that, I've got a quiz. So could, do you have a piece of paper? Um, this would, is... Would you say uh, like a, with an extra ocular muscle palsy is incomplete? So if it's not like, so if they don't have like a thalmoplegia of the third nerve, then you can say that it's incomplete. Okay. Even if they have like complete ptosis and like affecting all the directions, just not complete okay. affecting. Okay, so so complete ptosis, and and by the complete I mean yeah. like they may be able to a deduct a little bit like that uh, diabetic third that I showed you. There was a little bit of adduction, there was a little bit of elevation, but it was complete ptosis, no pupil involvement. That's a complete third, okay? The partial thirds are where the lid isn't completely down. Well, only one or two muscles are really involved. The, those incomplete thirds are the ones that are gonna get you into trouble, okay? And, and, and remember, and, and the bottom line is third nerve palsies, if they don't make you nervous, they should. And, if, and, and I want everybody to think about, you see a third nerve palsy, almost all of them get imaged, almost all of them. Maybe except, you know, diabetic, hypertensive, hyperlipidemic, I mean, totally complete, like we saw yesterday. You could, could, you could argue, why image this? That's what this is. It was painful third nerve palsy in a diabetic, uh, you know, but whose hemoglobin A1C was like 12 uh, out of control. The lipids were off the chart. I mean, he was a mess, so. Okay, a 55-year-old patient, this is uh, number one. A 55-year-old patient with diabetes presents with diplopia, which would lead you to order an MR of the brain as the initial test? An isolated pupil sparing complete third nerve palsy of three days duration, a third nerve uh, palsy with bilateral fatigable ptosis, an isolated pupil sparing third nerve palsy of eight months duration, a, a patient with lid retracted, restricted up gaze, and a slight proptosis. Which would have you order the uh, an MR as your initial test? One of them. Dang it. I know, I know, you want imaging for everything, but there's only one on this one. There's one that we talked about. Okay, ready? Number two. What is indicated if you suspect aberrant regeneration in a resolving ocular motor palsy number three, presumed to be from diabetes? 
no further workup, said rate, CRP, MR, LP. So it's aberrant regeneration. Okay. Three, a diabetic has diplopia with limited elevation, depression, adduction, ptosis on the left. Pupils are three millimeters on the right, 3.6 on the left in light, and five and 5.5 in darkness. Your next step would be to reassure and follow up in three months, image, do a tensilon test, have the patient return to clinic every day to watch the pupil to see if it gets bigger. Number four, a 75-year-old man has a pupil sparing right third nerve palsy. The right corneal nerve sensation reflex is absent. The headache, a headache is present on the right side. Are you going to do an MR with gadolinium looking at the cavernous sinus? Do an angiogram to look for an aneurysm? Uh, sed rate to look for giant cell arteritis? Or a tensilon test? What will be your initial study? Ready? A six-year-old child comes in with a third nerve palsy. The possible diagnosis includes a myasthenia, aneurysm, migraine, schwannoma, or all of the above. Number six, true and false. A nuclear third would present with a bilateral ptosis. True or false? Seven. If you suspect Telosa Hunt, don't image, just start steroids immediately and see if it resolves. True or false? A woman presents with a quote unquote blown pupil, but a completely normal exam. Your next step is an MR scan, dilute pilocarpine, full strength pilocarpine, admit to the hospital with a neurologic consultation. Number nine, a person with a pupil involving third nerve palsy has a normal MR, MRA. Your next step is reassurance, a lumbar puncture, angiogram, or a tensilon test. And number 10, the third nerve passes between the superior cerebellar artery, the posterior cerebellar cerebral artery, both of the above or none of the above. And number 11, the pupillary fibers are always inferior on the third nerve. And all of these can be seen in the novel library, so all those videos that we showed today are in the novel library just to tell you about it. Okay, let's go back to the quiz. Uh, number one, 55-year-old diabetes, double vision. Uh, uh, what, which one would lead you to order the MR as the initial test? C. 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 That's correct. Okay, because it's eight months duration. What is indicated if you see aberrant regeneration? C. 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 MR scan. A diabetic has diplopia with limited uh, everything and the pupils are like that. What your, would your uh, next step be? A. A. Reassurance. Reassurance. Okay, so this one, I would say there's relative pupillary sparing. I would get an MR because the MR is the patient, the pupils are unequal uh, in both light and darkness. Uh, and it's it's over, you know, uh, it's it's over, it's over, not quite a millimeter. It's a half a millimeter. I would probably get an MRI scan on this one. I, I thought you said that there was. I thought you considered this relative pupil sparing, and this was like a little bit anisocoria, like you're saying. You came in after the slide that said relative pupil sparing, and I watched when you came in. <laughs> you came in after the slide that says relative pupil sparing in 24 patients, 12 of them were something else. Okay? The rest of you got this one, right? Yes. yes.
because we talked about this. Okay, just say it. You miss a second, you lose a point. Okay, 75-year-old man, uh, pupil sparing right third, but a corneal reflex is gone. A. Six-year-old with the third nerve palsy. E. E, all of the above. They can have anything. Uh, third nerve palsy, nuclear third would present with bilateral ptosis. True. True. Telosa hunt, don't image, just start steroids. False. False. A person comes in with a blown pupil in a normal exam, completely normal exam. B, dilute pilocarpine testing. And then if that didn't work, the full strength pilocarpine because you're looking for somebody who's got pharmacologic uh, dilation. And, and uh, these can be hard, I, I recognize, and sometimes you have to think differently. Uh, so then a person with a pupil involving third nerve palsy with a normal MR, normal MRA, the next step would be, I will accept B or C, because I in, in this situation, I would keep going, either B or C. I would not reassure, and I wouldn't do a Tenslon test, because the pupil's involved, and we talked about that. Okay, third nerve uh, passes between... It's, it's C. C. It passes, and I said this how many times? <laughs> At the beginning, before you came in, Marshall. <laughs> superior cerebral, the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. It passes right between those two arteries as it comes out of the third nerve. And the pupillary fibers are always inferior. Now, this one I know you got because I showed the pupil fibers like three times. <laughs> What is it, true or false? False. False. All right, good. All right, so troubling thirds. Can you see where I say they're troubling? Yeah. I mean, yeah. they should keep you awake every night. Even, <laughs> I know, I, seriously, I see a third nerve palsy. I saw one yesterday, and so I don't, my sleep score last night was bad because I saw the third nerve palsy. I also saw eight other patients, many of whom had really bad stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was a... You know, but third nerve palsy, even when you think you've got every rule, they never follow the rules, and they should make you all uncomfortable. And, and if you walk out of here with the respect, total respect for the third nerve, I've done my job, okay? <laughs> all right, so um, I'll take your scores. Uh, the pie is on the line, and, uh, and, and we'll end this now. Mm -hmm.